My name is Steve Carroll and I am an art and art history teacher. I have taught on movements in art from the ancient and classical world to the 20th century and contemporary schools of thought. During that time I have focused on the lives and work of hundreds of great artists, usually with positive responses from my class. But the one artist very few students appreciate is Francis Bacon. His work is greeted with horror, bewilderment, disgust and even anger. I find this interesting because Bacon is often simply responding to the time and thinking of most of my students and doing so in a magnificent and monumental fashion. In this video I want to answer the question, why consider the art of Francis Bacon? I want to give three answers to this question. One, his imagery. Two, his handling of paint and colour. And three, his honesty. Throughout the history of Western art, there have been unforgettable images. The Mona Lisa, Van Hoff's sunflowers, Salvador Dali's melting clocks, but surely among those should be included the works by Francis Bacon. He burst onto the art world at the end of the Second World War with his three studies for figures at the base of a crucifixion. He claimed to have been inspired by Picasso's work of the 1930s, but creatures so visceral, so fleshy, so deformed had never appeared in painting before. Not even the work of Hieronymus Bosch or Dali comes this close to expressing the sheer horror of the war and the human condition made solid. His study after Velasquez's Pope Innocent X is another profound image and the most powerful of his screaming heads of the 1950s. Although I consider this phase with the dark backgrounds and the ghostly images to be his weakest period, this particular screaming Pope stands out. Bacon's abhorrence for religion is well known, but he also claimed his paintings contain no messages. The way to appreciate a Bacon painting is to react to its imagery and surface. He took the face of the screaming nurse from Eisenstein's movie Battleship Potumkin of 1925 simply because of the effect it had on him, and he transposed it into the face of a Pope. The result is a painting it is difficult not to try and interpret. Even the Pope, with all his pomp and attention, feels the same despair of life as we all do. The final image I want to look at is Bacon's triptych, Three Studies for a Crucifixion of 1962, painted to crown his Tate retrospective of that year. The first panel seems to show an older figure breaking the fourth wall whilst a younger man moves in the direction of a black doorway. Some have suggested this represents his relationship with his father who despised his illness and effeminate nature. The central panel is a horrific scene, like one of Jack the Ripper's victims in 19th century London. Again, nothing like this had been seen in the whole of Western art, even more brutal than Goya's Disasters of War series. The third panel appears to be the crucifixion, the one would expect to be at the centre of the triptych. However, instead of a Christ figure, we have a side of beef, fresh from the abattoir. Bacon would sometimes stare into butcher's shop windows and remark on the colour of freshly cut meat. I am not surprised at a reaction of horror to the work of Francis Bacon, but I am disappointed that observers cannot acknowledge his sheer power as a painter to reach beyond societal norms and touch a part of the human psyche so eloquently. Francis Bacon's art 
belongs aside the great art of the early 20th century. Even though he was painting at a time when artists were turning towards conceptual work, Bacon continued a European tradition of pushing painting as far as it would go. He loved oil paint and talked about throwing it onto the canvas, using a squeegee like the one one would use with lino printing, and even rubbing a woolen jumper into the paint and making marks with that. I have mentioned the fleshiness of his figures in his Three Studies of 1946, but the smoothness of flesh is accompanied by expressive strokes which remain in context. The orange colour of the backgrounds has been linked to the fires that ravaged London during the Blitz, when Bacon was working as an ambulance man, but I think they look like toxic surfaces, as if these creatures dwell inside radioactive chambers. To anyone interested in painting with oils, Bacon's work is an education in both technique and in his use of colour. So what was Francis Bacon all about? I have mentioned his dislike of religion, but he also spoke of losing his faith as a young man, which means he had a faith when he was a young man. He also spoke to close friends about a religious experience he had just after the death of his lover, George Dyer. Any mention of that experience, he later hated to be reminded of. Bacon's work is basically about nihilism, a lack of belief in anything. Life has no meaning, and humans have no intrinsic value. We really are like those carcasses hanging in the butcher's shop window. But despite this, Francis was a good friend to those close to him, and he was generous in helping people out financially. Today's atheism is peddled as a respectable, middle-class necessity. Our society is swift to point the finger at the faults of the past or the strange behaviour of other cultures, but it is slow to examine its own absurdities and the logical conclusions of its beliefs. Bacon holds up a mirror to our secular age and forces us to reconsider the world we glorify in. Modern science has been responsible for as many atrocities as blessings, and our arrogance is accompanied by depressive illnesses of epidemic proportions. As Christ said, Do not offer to remove the speck from your brother's eye, and neglect the plank in your own eye.